it was going to be a two-stage deal. Um, the first stage would have burned for two years. It would have accelerated up to about 7% um, of the speed of light. Uh, the second stage would have burned for another 1.8 years and accelerated to about 12% of the speed of light. Um, the engine bell would have been in beryllium, which I noted earlier was a very inert high temperature, which is important because um, you're going to have a huge temperature gradient on this thing, and like the diffusion is taking place to what um, the other engines in the bottom. And also, once it shuts down, it, you're going to have to deal with the temperature of the interstellar space, which is pretty cold. It's warm. It's cold, but the power flux from the actual app. It's pretty hot, but the power coming into the bell is pretty shitty because there's very few atoms that transfer. So, um, hmm. oh yeah, and on the top there was going to be a giant 50 ton beryllium disk to protect it from the green radiation of the interstellar particles. And the second stage bell was all engine bell, would have also served as a communications disk. So, this is just a gigantic robot with a huge engine, and this is the spatial mm -hmm. scale. You guys, mm -hmm. <laughs> this is a Friday T70s. What's the ICF? ICF? What is that? The 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 yeah, So yeah, it's an enabling technology. So this whole thing was developed by the British Interplanetary Society, I forget if it's the 70s or the 80s. But it was an idea for an interstellar probe. Their, their biggest concern was that if we're going to do like a probe to a star, to give the mission a sense of continuity, we needed to have it within the lifetime of the project manager. <laughs> <laughs> that would be nice. So it's actually like like in, the, <coughs> like in the motivational paragraphs of this paper, they're like, well, like our big our biggest challenge here is actually have, giving this mission a sense of continuity. So to do that, we need to make the mission the ship needs to go very fast. It needs to go twelve percent of speed. Um, so it would have reached, I think, in about fifty years. It would have actually reached. Okay, yeah. So one issue we don't, one issue here is we actually don't know a lot about Bernard's star. So the, the probe would actually have to um, sort of scope out the system ahead of time. It would kind of do less. So it had this. Um, so about um, twenty-five years after leaving the solar system, um, it would have used. It had a five-meter optical telescope, a two-meter uh, radio telescope, and it would just, and it would basically have located any exoplanets in the system. And uh, assign targets, and the targets would be um, delegated to its own army of robotic probes. At about 7.2 light years out from the target, um, it would deploy its probes to explore the system. And these guys wouldn't break either, all right? So you've got an army of very fast objects, and they're going to explore the solar system. And basically, uh, they they basically the only the only advantage to these things is instead of one really fast object that can't really get close to anything, you get a bunch of these things, and they hopefully go um, past a lot of different targets. And they deploy about and uh, another part of its robotic arsenal was its dust probes, and these were um, vehicles that would deploy about 200 kilometers ahead of the vehicle during a uh, cruise, and they basically um, disperse the debris by shooting out artificial. And those particles would basically um, collide with uh, any incoming debris. And at that speed, basically, like even though they're very little mass, these particles, uh, the momentum they actually end up uh, transferring to the incoming debris would end up being significant enough to hopefully uh, avoid it. And now, so this was like a cool idea, but the coolest idea was what some computer scientists did to this uh, to this thing, and that is the Daedalus Repro. And repro is short for reproducing. Uh, Robert Freitas in 1980 came up with uh, the Daedalus repro. And the difference between the Daedalus repro, it's basically a Neumann machine, okay? Like, so the, the difference between, so here's the problem, here's the problem. He's like, okay, so contact between interstellar civilizations um, would, actually, would actually be very difficult owing to the fact that Radio waves and, um, and, and light communication would attenuate very, very fast at long distances. And B, since you're constrained with the speed of light problem, you're going to need um, whatever sort of thing you're using to communicate with them needs to be, should be in close proximity and be able to make independent decisions, um, sort of in the vicinity of the alien civilization, 
where are there the line on potentially hundreds of years delays between different signals from your civilization to the other civilization? So what we need is an automated communication machine. And they thought, well, if we're going to be looking, there's so many, there's so many planets and stars in the galaxy. We're actually going to be like looking for contacts. We're going to be able to make a lot of these things, right? Hence the repro was um, born. And the repro was basically another data. It was a, it was the dataless pro that I talked about earlier. But the change to the design is that a it carries much more fuel so that it can slow down when it reaches the system, and b it carries a factory on board. And when it reaches the solar system, the factory is smashed, is, is installed on one of the planets, and there is also another robotic arsenal that um, prospects the solar system, searches for raw materials and resources, and gathers them up, and over the course of about 800 years, builds another Daedalus probe and launches it. And it also continues to pump out Daedalus probes every about 800 years. And I'm sure you could have added implementations to this thing to actually increase the size of the robot arsenal, so it could actually increase the productivity. So the idea of this was to flood, was, was, was to flood the universe with uh, probes with really gigantic spaceships moving at about 12% the speed of light. Like, think about this, it's really great. And it does science forever, which is the most important part of it. And uh, hopefully there'd be about one civilization out in the next 100 years. Oh, and the really co the coolest part about this it, at the end of this paper, like seriously, Google Robert Creatus, um, Daedalus probe. He talked about sexual evolution of the probe, and he talked about like different probes being artificially selected over like very long amounts of time, and possibly like and like he was talked about the possibility of like sexual reproduction involving these probes and stuff, and, like all kinds of weird stuff, and like it was just really cool. <laughs> Would there be any objections if we emailed this to like all of us? I would ask, I'll send you all the documents that you mentioned for it. This is the coolest thing ever, by the way. Pretty much. This is it. This oh is my it. god. So take a good long look because it's about to disappear. No. We're going to go to something a little less ambitious. Project Longshot. Um, the only reason I included this is because there's a wonderful narrative in this one about how, about traveling to another star system. Um, uh, Longshot was similar to Daedalus. Except it was a lot less ambitious in that it wasn't 180 years long. Um, it was designed, I think, in the late 80s, early 90s. At this point, they expected us to be building something called Space Station Alpha, which is supposed to be the actual launching point for this probe. Um, in order to facilitate communications with Earth, they decided that they'd actually need another power source on the thing, so they added um, a 300 kilowatt reactor to power the communications laser. It would have only been 100, 396 tons. So it's a lot less ambitious than Daedalus. And it would have reached Alpha Centauri in about 100 years. Um, again, human <coughs> is the greatest challenge here. When your whole, when your whole, when, 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 when the entire staff of the project has died off, it becomes very difficult to continue it. So um, they tried, they wanted to keep it under two centuries. What? And another little uh, innovation they added to it was um, the escaping ions from the uh, system to recharge the system to make, to make more energy production. Um, there aren't many good pictures from this paper, but it has a wonderful narrative. Okay. So basically, um, the first stage, so all the, until it actually leaves the solar system, it would have been under the power of ten kilowatts. Um, the first thing that would happen is it would be in orbit, it would be in roughly equatorial orbit, Alpha. Right? And the first stage would have brought it into about a 61 degree elliptical orbit. Yeah. And the first stage leaves. So now it's it's still bound to the Earth. It's a 61 degrees to the Earth. Um, the second burn would have taken it, so then the second stage fires. And after this, the sun. Then you have the probe. It goes into a 61. It goes into a 61 degree orbit around the um, around the actual sun. Okay, after leaving the after achieving escape velocity from the Earth. And at this point, it could do one of two things. Some design, some designs of this uh, for this actually call for it to visit Jupiter to take on fuel for its star drive, because um, it turns out we don't have a lot of 